I rise to speak on the debate on the bill shortly entitled the Firearms Prohibition Restriction and Regulation Act 2012. 2022, thank you. Hmm. Madam Speaker, the, <clears throat> the problem of violent crime in the country is a chronic one, and the use of the firearm as the main purveyor of violence which results in death, murders, has become all too pervasive in this country. And I just want to go on record to reaffirm that this is not an issue over which politics should be played in the sense of any individual or party seeking to derive some kind of partisan benefit from leveraging any perceived opportunity to score points. That's not in the interest of the country. This situation that we're in is so dire and we're almost like a frog in the pot of water which is sitting on a stove getting hotter and hotter and because we're in it, it's not, we almost become numb to or immune to the, if the facts until it touches us directly because we're fed a daily diet of horrible and horrific stories in this country of incidents of violence which we all have to live through. Just yesterday there were killings in several different parts of the corporate area and as I've said it is a situation which I think above all others now is crying for attention, crying for a solution and any solution must enjoy the support of the elective rep representatives of the people on both sides of this aisle. And I was at a funeral not so long ago where I think four children and their mother had been brutally murdered in Clarendon. And I said to the Prime Minister, who was also in attendance, that he, I will support any bona fide effort to lawfully address this problem, subject to the constraints of the Constitution, which we are sworn to uphold and defend. And we know that we've had some differences around that particular issue. issue and those differences are one of principle. And I would ask that, that our position be respected as coming from that position, not one that is driven by politics. And we wouldn't want the response to be driven by politics because it is a particular con principle and conscience for us. Anyway, that is not why we're, we're not debating that today. We have a new firearms bill here. It's a substantial document. It runs some 100 and 33 pages of text, and it's a dense and, so, and quite complex document. It went through a joint select committee, and in keeping with what I've just said, the contribution of the opposition of the committee was constructive and was appreciated, I believe, by the minister, and he has said so, and I thank him for that. The main, one of the main objectives of this legislation is deterrence. The minister said it quite clearly. It is his hope that the provisions in this legislation, which are by any accounts punitive, draconian, will have a chilling effect on the minds of those who would otherwise engage in violent crime using firearms. And that is an objective which all of us must support because, as I've said, this is a situation that we must arrest and bring an end to. It will not be an overnight solution, whatever happens, but at least if we can reverse the cycle or reverse the trend to move 
from a position where it's getting worse and worse to one where it's getting better and better, we will have achieved a lot as parliamentarians. So I approach this legislation from that perspective. Having said that, I have some concerns. My principal concern reflects what was actually stated in the minority report in the Joint Select Committee that was proffered by the opposition members of that committee. And essentially, it relates to the separation of powers, which are, is a fundamental principle of our governance arrangements. And the role of the judiciary in adjudicating matters that come before the courts. The sentencing function, Madam Speaker, in a, in a criminal justice system is a fundamental function and responsibility of the judiciary. It is really where the rubber hits the road in terms of their, the judiciary's intersection with the population. Because in the criminal justice system, it is there in the, in the sentencing function that the citizen who is before the court in a criminal matter feels the effects of the justice being administered to him or her. The principle upon which this is based is one of doing justice in the particular case before the court. Courts are not about doing rough justice. They're not about doing statistical policy justice. They are about achieving justice for that individual or those individuals who are in the dock, who have been brought before the court, charged with a criminal offense or offenses, and have a right to have those matters adjudicated in accordance with law, and if they are found guilty and convicted, to have the judge's discretion based on the facts before the judge, the evidence in the case, any statement from, a, from the victims, and any other assessment by probation officers as to circumstances in mitigation, the plea in mitigation by defense counsel, so that the right punishment can be inflicted to fit the crime and the circumstances of the crime. This is a fundamental issue, Madam Speaker. We live in a society where, as parliamentarians, we are, I would say, desperate to be seen to be doing something that hopefully will be effective, something that will be reflective of the society's demand on us to get this situation under control. On the other hand, we are governed by the rule of law. We are a democratic country, and we enjoy the freedoms of a democratic system of governance. And the role of the judiciary in the criminal justice system in around sentencing is a very fundamental constitutional role. Now, it has been said in here before, and I would not seek to deny it, that the highest courts have adjudicated that mandatory minimum sentencing is not unconstitutional. Notwithstanding that it, it does to some extent curtail the ability of the judge to determine the sentence because the, the law, in a case where the law by statute sets a mandatory minimum sentence, it is not open to the judge to go below that. Having said that, mandatory sentences have been held in certain circumstances to be unconstitutional. So the mandatory imposition of the death penalty for murder was found by the Privy Council to be an unconstitutional punishment because it took away the discretion of the court to do justice in a particular case, depending on the circumstances. And as a result of that, our law relating to murder was, was changed. And we adopted a bifurcated approach where we identified the more heinous categories of murder, which are loosely defined as capital murder, 
though that's not an expression used in the law. But it's a convenient uh, rubric or label to attach to those categories of offenses which, under the Offense of Offense of Person Act, potentially attract the death penalty. I say potentially because it's, it's up to the court to decide whether or not to impose it. And if the person is convicted of one of those offenses known as capital murder, the court can impose the death penalty subject to certain procedural requirements, or if they don't do so, impose a life sentence. The vast majority of cases that come before the court in Jamaica where murder is charged are not capital murder cases. They are again loosely categorized as non-capital murder cases. Loosely because that phrase is not in the, the law either, but it's a convenient label to attach to all of the range of circumstances in which murder, if charged and resulting in a conviction, will attract a sentence other than death. The death penalty is not available to the court in a non-capital murder case. I say all of that because where we are here with this legislation is we're moving in a particular direction because this legislation imposes mandatory life sentences for uh, several offenses in this act. Several, not just one, several. Including the basic offense of illegal possession of a firearm. Hmm? Well, I say basic because in the category of firearms offenses, in the category, in the category, in the category of firearms offenses, most of them involve a firearm being used in a particular way. For example, shooting with intent to commit. Basic, by just by virtue of the fact that you were found in possession of this web of this gun, and you didn't have a license to hold it, that it is a, it is an offence. So it is a, it is the most basic form of firearm offence. It doesn't matter. You don't have to prove any intent as to how you, what you intended to do with it. Just the fact that you had it in your possession is the gist of the offence and the fact that it's illegal. That's why I said it's basic. I'm not, I'm not casting any moral judgment by using the word basic. I was just describing where it lies in the scheme of offences under our firearm legislation. In this instance, what is happening is that regardless of the circumstances, yeah, regardless of the circumstances in which a person was in possession of a firearm. If that person is not lawfully in possession of it, the court has no discretion in the matter. A life sentence must be imposed under section five, under clause five of the bill. If you're convicted, clearly. If you're, not, if you're, if you're acquitted, you go home scot-free. So that is only one of the new life A prohibited firearm, which includes a, fire, a prohibited firearm, is defined as a, including a lot of things. But one of the things that is defined as including is, and I'll read it, is any firearm in respect of which no firearm authorization is granted under Part 5. So if, it's not, if you're not authorized to have it by a license under the, through the FLA under Part 5, then it's a prohibited weapon. So, but that is only one of the situation. That's only one, but it's perhaps the most far-reaching of the new life sentences, provisions, offenses that are being created here. And of course, it, the provision in Clause 5 also speaks to the question of parole and says, not only do you get a life sentence, but you do not become eligible for parole until 15 years has been served. Now, eligibility parole doesn't mean you get parole. Eligibility parole, if you're not eligible, you can't even apply for parole. Parole is a discretion. It's a discretionary power given to the parole board. Many people, many convicts, 
are not granted parole on their first application. Many of them are never granted parole and have to apply and apply and apply. So one shouldn't treat 15 years as the minimum. It is a, the, this is an offense, and there are several of them in this legislation, which there is a mandatory life sentence. Now, the circumstances in which somebody can be illegally in possession of a prohibited weapon range from a gunman hold, having a gun in the course of committing a murder or an act of terrorism or an armed robbery right through to a, a youngster who has been threatened and has has access through the underworld or to, in the community in which he or her lives to a firearm and says he's or she is carrying that because they think they are under threat and they don't think the police can defend them. So there is a, and there are other, the, the, the possibilities in which one could be illegal in possession of a prohibited weapon are very wide ranging, which means that the mandatory life sentence could be considered to be disproportionate to the potential crime before the court. That raises constitutional issues, and I'm not in a position to say when this legislation is tested in the court, and I have no doubt it will be, what the outcome of that test will be. But the reason why I will not be voting against it is because there is a safety valve. And the safety valve was created by us in 2015 when we passed the Criminal Justice Amendment Act of 2015. And that act created a new Part 1A and Part 1B two new parts, 1A and 1B, to the Criminal Justice Administration Act. And part 1B is the safety valve in this instance because it says that if the court, when faced with a prescribed minimum penalty, feels that the imposition of that penalty is excessive and manifestly unjust, in the circumstances of the case, the court shall issue a certificate to that effect, stating the reasons why the court feels that way. And that matter is then referred to a judge of the Court of Appeal for review. And if the judge of the Court of Appeal agrees with that assessment by the trial court, then even though there's a prescribed minimum in the law, the Court of Appeal judge has the power to impose whatever sentence they consider to be proportionate to the crime and the circumstances in which the crime took place. That is the safety valve. I have a concern about the safety valve, which I'll speak to later, but that is the essential tool by which I assume the Attorney General, when this matter is tested in the Constitutional Court, will be seeking to argue that it is demonstrably justifiable in a free and democratic society for this legislation to pass and be upheld by the court because even though the imposition of a mandatory life sentence for so many additional offenses, some of them not involving any perpetration of an act of violence, because mere possession in and of itself, or possession simpliciter, doesn't import necessarily any act of violence. Notwithstanding that, the motive of the person who has been convicted may not be one other than the preservation of their own life or their family, depending on the circumstances. And therefore, there's a total lack of proportionality on the face of it between the imposition of a life sentence in that type of case and what was the actual act involved. The fact that there's a safety process there 
by which that can be rectified and justice could be achieved in the sentencing should result in it being upheld. But there's another concern I have, and it's to do with the impact of this on the court system. The deterrent effect of this legislation will depend largely on whether or not persons who would use firearms illegally will be brought to account for doing so, and brought to account efficiently and effectively through a justice system that works. Now, I have some concerns with the impact that this legislation is going to have on the court system. And as, and as I've said to you at the, out, at the outset, what I'm saying here today is motivated entirely by a desire for us to do the right thing and adopt the best policy. That's the only motivation I have. I'm a former justice minister. I have a passionate concern for the justice system as a whole. In the minister's statement yesterday, in paragraph five, he said, data show that in 2020, in the High Court Division of the Gun Court, illegal possession of firearm and illegal possession of ammunition accounted for the highest shares of cases, with 33.68% and another 20.38% respectively of the sample. So they together amount to over half of the cases in the gun court, illegal possession of a firearm or illegal possession of ammunition. Shooting with intent accounted for the next highest incidence. What this legislation has done is that it has eliminated the applicability of the other part, part 1A of the 2015 amendment to the Criminal Justice Administration Act, which was a response to the high level of backlog in the criminal courts and the desire to find an effective way to treat with that through inducing persons who have committed offenses rather than waste the court's time or take their chances with the system failing, whether because they interfere with it through intimidating or killing witnesses or bribing or intimidating jurors or otherwise obstructing justice or just because of the, fail the weaknesses in the criminal justice system itself where the police are often not very efficient and effective in their preparation of criminal cases. It was an inducement to, to them to say as soon as possible in the system, once your case is before the court and you're charged with a criminal offense, plead guilty if you're guilty. And if you did, the court was empowered. It was not mandated. It was a discretionary facility given to the court that the court could give a discount on what it would otherwise have granted by way of a sentence if that person had been tried and found guilty. Many, many cases have been disposed of and persons have been sent to prison as a result of that provision. And many, many of those cases are firearms cases. By dis excluding firearms cases from that regime under this legislation, because that's what we're doing for part two offenses, which are the, co the main collection of offenses. There are offenses all over there, but Part two is a critical part of that. That statutory facility to encourage guilty persons to plead guilty no longer applies. You know, for them, to, for them to not face a trial and conviction, they would have to enter into a formal plea bargaining agreement. Where, and we, we know already that the prevalence with which that is being used is not what we would like. And, not, and many accused persons aren't even in a position to grant that kind of assistance for whatever reason. They may not be involved in the criminal world in a way that would enable them to be of use in other cases. The effect of this is going to be that all of those cases 
that were being addressed and handled in that way will all have to go to trial because nobody is likely to plead guilty where they're going to face a life sentence. They're going to take their chances. And it is going to impose on the criminal courts a huge additional burden which they do not, that they're not currently carrying. There's also the psychological effect to bear in mind on the mind of a judge who knows that his or her primary constitutional role is to do justice in the particular case and that sentencing is a core function of the judiciary and that parliament has taken away that function from them and told them, forget the circumstances of the case before you. That doesn't matter. You must impose a life sentence on this individual. How they respond to that remains to be seen. How they assess the evidence, how they assess the issue of credibility of witnesses, their inclination to adjudicate the question of proof beyond a reasonable doubt, which is the criminal standard of proof in a criminal case, remains to be seen. But I would suspect that in some, in, I, would, I would suspect that in some instances, judges are going to be particularly cautious in assessing evidence, knowing that if, they, if guilt is found, they have to impose a life sentence for possession, illegal possession of a prohibited weapon. That's my view. You may differ, and you can speak about it, but I, my view is that, that is a, there, is a, there is a risk. There is a risk of that. And I'd ask you, don't interrupt me. You can always speak to it afterwards. That is your right in this parliament. Thank you. So, from a policy perspective, we have A, the fact that the removal of the discount for guilty plea statutory regime from firearms offenses altogether is going to result, very predictably, in a very substantial increase in the caseload of the criminal courts that are already under tremendous pressure, despite the best efforts of myself and my successor, Minister Chuck, and the judiciary itself to address these issues in a resource-constrained environment. And secondly, there is the impact that the mandatory life sentence for offenses which in the past didn't attract life sentences will have on the adjudication process itself, which remains to be seen. What this is saying is now going forward, well over 50% of the cases in the gun court are going to be cases where there are li mandatory life sentences applied. That's a huge, that's a new paradigm for the courts to address. That is a totally new mindset. And as I've said, it remains to be seen, A, how when it is tested, the Constitutional Court will react to it, and B, what effect it's going to have, though it's predictable that it's going to have a, a fairly dramatic effect on the case flow in the criminal justice system, and thirdly, what effect it will have on the adjudicating judge's attitude towards assessing evidence and passing a sentence of guilty in the gun court, which is trial by judge alone, not by jury. So those are my obs observations, broad observations, on what I regard as some of the more troubling aspects of this legislation. But as I've said, I believe that because my main concern is the way in which it traverses and trespasses on the proper province under the separation of powers, which is of the role of the judiciary, which was my main concern from a constitutional perspective, because the Criminal Justice Act, as amended in 2015, provides a safety mechanism whereby that is not the final say on the matter. I am not going to vote against it. I would add that it is going to significantly increase the workload of the Court of Appeal because there will, nobody has ever had a life sentence imposed on them before for illegal possession of a firearm. 
and you're going to have 50 odd percent of the cases based on the 2020 data that now attract life sentences, mandatory life sentences that never did before. You can predict that a large number of, of those will be referred to a judge of a court of appeal. And I just wonder how they're going to cope with all that additional work. But we will see. Madam Speaker. One moment, please. The member's time for speaking has expired. Has it? Wow. Madam Speaker, I ask that the member be given sufficient time to complete his presentation. The question is that the member be given sufficient time to complete his presentation. Those in favor? Those against? The ayes have it. Opposition leader. I am much obliged, Madam Speaker and colleagues. I, I know I would add one last point on in relation to these broader concerns. We don't have any data before us. The minister didn't present any data. And I am told that in the Joint Select Committee, despite repeated requests for this data, it was never presented. As to how many cases since the 2015 amendment was passed, how many criminal cases have been disposed of by way of guilty pleas. It is a significant piece of information which is lacking from a policy perspective when considering the imposition of this. In particular, the removal of, the removal of that facility going forward from firearm offenses. I feel I'm flying in the dark. I, have a, I know that it is a significant number, but I do not know this, the volume. And I don't know why that data wasn't presented when we were I'm told it was asked for over and over again. And I'm, I'm disappointed, frankly, that that data is not before us. Yeah, OK, thank you, Minister. I, I'm sorry, I, asked, I had asked about it, and they told me they had asked for it. Yeah. The, the, I'm going to speak briefly now on some textual issues of concern to me in relation to this, the bill as, as it stands. The, the bill in, uses the concept of firearms or ammunition regulated under part four, that, that formulation firearms or ammunition regulated under part four is used in a number of places in the act. First, the first place I've identified it is in clause four, which is a scoping provision. It's an important provision because it says part two, which is where most of the critical offenses are, shall not apply to firearms or ammunition regulated under part four unless otherwise specifically provided in the Act. So the question of whether or not a firearm or ammunition is regulated under Part 4 is a very fundamental issue. Because if, if it is, then Part 2 doesn't apply to it, save and except where the Act specifically says it should. Having looked at Part 4, Minister, I struggled to identify what firearms and ammunition fall are regulated under Part 4. When you look at Part 4, it's not obviously a regulatory regime. It's a mixed bag of things in Part 4. And the, the heading of Part 4, restrictions in respect of firearms and ammunition, isn't on the face of it a language around regulation. It does a number of things uh, in Part 4, including creating a lot of offenses, including a life another mandatory life sentence provision in Clause 45. So I wondered in my mind what that was, what those words mean. They are also used in numerous other places in Part 5, because although on the scheme of it, Clause 4 is saying, if, you're a fire, if it's a firearm or ammunition regulated under Part 4, Part 2 doesn't apply to it. 
There are many, many places in part two which specifically says, or where it, it is specifically said, that part two shall apply. So, for example, in, in clause 11, which is to do with pawning a firearm or ammunition, it says this, this provision applies to firearms and ammunition regulated under part four, even though this provision is in part two, and part two on the face of it doesn't apply to part four firearms. This is an exception, and there are several of these exceptions. It, clause 12.3, clause 11.2, as I've said, clause 14.7, clause 15.3, clause 16.1, and clause 18.3. So although clause four says that part two doesn't apply to, to part four firearms and ammunition, there are numerous places where it does apply, expressly does apply. I'm asking for this to be clarified, Minister. I think this is very important because that formulation, as I've just said, is used infrequently around part two, and I think it needs to be absolutely clear what firearms and ammunition are regulated under part four. I think there should be a specific provision somewhere which says what that is, and I, ha I haven't been able to find it. I know I'm going to say that in not saying it's not there, because I didn't go through this you know, with a fine-tooth comb. I read it, but I didn't, you know, maybe that it's already covered, but I just, I'm asking for this to be clarified, because it's, that formulation is so important to the legislation. As I've said, it, it's a formulation that is used in a number of the offenses, the new criminal offenses in part two, and the scoping provision. So. I'm asking for that to be clarified. Then, the, another thing I'm interested in knowing, Minister, is how this legislation will impact pepper spray and mace. I brought two bills here, private members' bill, bills here, to clarify that pepper spray and mace are not covered by firearms legislation. There was a confusion in the law that was created some time ago where the offensive weapons legislation has a provision that says that it doesn't include firearm, pepper spray, and mace. But there was a question as to whether the definition of a firearm in the firearms at the old one was so broad in how it was worded that it might be considered to include pepper spray and mace. And indeed, there was even a court case where I think a high court judge had said that she thought it did fall within that definition. That was not the intention because when the offensive weapon legislation was passed, the assumption was that it was not prohibited, even if it was desirable for it to be regulated. And in the bills that I tabled, there's a provision for the minister to make regulations to regulate the distribution, importation, etc., of pepper spray and mace, if that's considered desirable. Those bills have not been debated. But they're in a, some, to some extent, they're superseded by this. And, well, they may be. I'm not sure if the offensive weapons one is, but the firearm, the, the other was an amendment to the old Firearms Act, which is definitely superseded by this. What is not clear to me, well, I think on reading this bill that it does not apply to pepper spray and mace. But I think it would be useful to have that said, um, either in the act itself or by you and recorded by Hansard, so that this matter is cleared up. Because you know, a, a, lot, a number of Jamaicans, especially women, who from time to time are attacked on the road and so on, and it's only pepper spray and mace used for self-defense. If it's used offensively, that is an offense, and that should be an offense. But if it's held and used for self-defense, it should not be illegal. So I'm asking for that to be made clear, Minister. The next point I wanted to, to raise. There is some, I would say, inconsistency or anomaly. There's an anomaly in which the 
the penalties in the Act are applied across different sections. So, for example, Clause 15 of the Bill says that if you're in possession of any firearm or ammunition with intent, by that means, to injure any person or cause serious damage to property, that's an offence. Obviously, it should be. And, but it goes on to say that the penalty for that is imprisonment of not less than 15 years, no more than 25 years. So there's a 15 to 25 year window of discretion for the sentence for that section. How does that compare with possession simpliciter, which doesn't involve any such intent to injure anybody or cause serious damage? That's not inherent to the offense, but it attracts a mandatory life sentence. That sounds, that sounds, that's an anomaly in my, my mind. And I'm just highlighting one, but there are a number of other offenses where, which are, in my view, are more serious offenses than possession simpliciter, but which attacked a significantly lesser sentence than the mandatory life sentence applicable to possession simpliciter. And I'm concerned about this because a constitutional court assessing this legislation and is going to look at its overall coherence and the proportionality of its provisions. And I think that the way in which the sentencing is ascribed across different offenses, where less serious offenses attract a more onerous penalty than more serious offenses, undermines that scheme of coherence. And I raise that for your consideration, Minister. The other two points I wish to make before I take my seat are, first of all, there's an amendment to the Extradition Act, which is in the, the schedule that deals with amendments to other enactments, and I believe that is um, the seventh schedule. And the amendment to the Extradition Act creates extraditable offenses or extradition offenses out of several of the offenses in this legislation here, which of course is obviously necessary and supportable. But the offense under Section 45 is not included in that list. And that's just one that jumped out at me. As I said, there are many offenses in this, that part of the Act which 45 is included in, which is part four. But I highlight clause 45 because it attracts a mandatory life sentence. It is another form of being in possession of a firearm or ammunition without an authorization. In a sense, it's it, it is duplicative of clause five because if the definition of prohibited weapon includes a firearm for which there's no authorization of, under part five, you could be charged for the same thing under Clause 5 or under Clause 45. Perhaps both, I don't know. That prosecutor would have to tell me that. But it seems strange to me that uh, the offense created by Clause 45, which creates a mandatory life sentence under the schedule, because it's, it's tucked away in the schedule, the, the, the penalty for that. And it's um, on page 115 in the, I think it is the, sixth schedule, that it's imprisoned it, on conviction before the circuit court, the penalty for that section 45 offense is imprisonment for life. And there are several others actually where the sixth schedule provides imprisonment for life, including um, section 33, 2, 33, 3, 38, 2, 40, subsection 5, and as I've said, 45. But the, the Extradition Act amendment doesn't make an extradition offense out of some of those, 45 being one of them, but I think there are others as well. And I'm quite not sure why that would be, to my mind. If something is punishable in Jamaica by a mandatory life sentence, I can't understand the justification for it not being an, an extradition offense. And the final point. Madam Speaker, that I wish to make. 
is a small point, but it relates to the use of a term which I couldn't find a definition of. I'm sure it's there, but I'd love it to be pointed, me to, if someone could point me to it. It's in Clause 58, 3C, where it makes reference to a restricted person. I wasn't able to find what a restricted person is. Um, as I said, I, I, it's probably there, but I couldn't find it. So I'm just asking for that to be clarified. Hmm? Page, page, page 47, at the top of page 47, it's clause 58.3c. 58.3c, yeah. So, Madam Speaker, as I have said, for the opposition not to support this legislation, I think it would have to cross a very serious bar of, of being objectionable. And to my mind, while I have major concerns as to how this will work in practice, its impact on the court system, from the point of view of the fundamental justice issues in it, and the constitutionality of the usurpation of the proper province of the judiciary in sentencing, the fact that there is a safety valve in the 2015 Act, which amended the Criminal Justice Act, is significant and causes me not to be inclined to vote against this legislation. I will, I will not vote against it. There's one last point, which I, I nearly overlooked, sorry, and it's very important. I'm glad I didn't overlook it. It relates to that safety valve. Madam Speaker, the safety valve of which I speak, which is part 1B uh, of, the, of the Criminal Justice Act, Amendment, uh, Administration Act, which as I said allows the court, the sentencing court, the trial court, where it feels that the, the prescribed minimum penalty would be manifestly excessive and unjust in the circumstances of the particular case can refer the matter for review to a judge of the Court of Appeal. That the jurisdiction that that Part 1B creates only arises if it is an offense punishable by a prescribed minimum penalty. Now the words prescribed minimum penalty, it's not a defined term, but I'm concerned as to the, whether those words would apply to a mandatory life sentence. I say that because, for example, in the case of non-capital murder, which it, the Offence Against the Person Act says that if you're convicted for, for, one, for murder in circumstances other than those which would mean it was capital murder, then you are to be sentenced to imprisonment for life or such other term as the court considers appropriate, not being less than 15 years. So in that instance, there is a prescribed minimum of 15 years created by the law. Similarly, in relation to rape under the Sexual Offenses Act, or I think grievous sexual assault, if, those, if a person is charged and tried in the circuit court for either of those two sexual offenses, I think they attract the potential for a life sentence but in any event, a sentence of not less than 15 years. So that's a prescribed minimum sentence there. And similarly, there was a, a time when shooting with intent covered, carried a mandatory minimum of 15 years. I think it still does, actually, of, of 15 years. So the idea of a prescribed minimum penalty suggests to me that there's a range that the law allows but there's a, the law imposes a bottom to that range, and the trial court, that give, the sentencing court, can't go below that minimum. That's the prescribed minimum penalty. In relation to these offenses that impose a mandatory life sentence, there's no minimum or maximum. It's a fixed penalty. It's a, it is life. There's no range. It's not a minimum. It's not a maximum. It is the penalty that applies on conviction. I'm not sure that that falls within the formulation of a prescribed minimum penalty in Part 1B. And if that were not so, it would mean that the safety valve on which I am relying 
in saying that I would not vote against this particular piece of legislation would not achieve the objective of being a safety valve in the cases where mandatory life is the sentence prescribed by this legislation here. So I'm asking, Minister, please, if you would clarify that by ensuring that it is made clear in Part 1B of the Criminal Justice Act as amended in 2015 that prescribed minimum penalty includes a mandatory life sentence imposed under the Firearms Prohibition, Restriction and Regulation Act 2022. If that is done, Minister, I feel more comfortable that the safety valve, which I think is absolutely critical to the constitutionality of this legislation, not to say that it's a not to say that it will pass muster, that a court would determine that, but from my perspective, with due deference to the national desire for an effective response to this epidemic of violent crime using guns, if, if that safety valve isn't there, I wouldn't be able to support it, but I can because there is a safety valve. I just want to make sure the safety valve isn't leaking. Thank you, Madam Speaker.